Hey guys, John Paulamy here, Actionable Intelligence. Today is Saturday, May 27th, and this is the weekly market update. The disclaimer, anything that you hear or see on this video or podcast is not investment advice. This is for informational purposes only. Please do your own research, your own due diligence. It's your money. It's your responsibility. So my voice is a little bit messed up because uh, I had to go to D.C. last week for some meetings. And it seems like every time I travel, I, you know, I really take a lot of vitamin D and supplementation. And I also do uh, take ivermectin as like a prophylactic prophylaxis for this COVID stuff. And so it seems like I just picked up a little bit of a, you know, bug. So that's why my voice is a little bit screwy, but. I don't really feel sick or anything. It's just like a, I don't know, runny nose thing and post-nasal drip. So apologize for that. Okay, let's get into the information. So um, this is from an article or an interview that was done by a German, I don't know, periodical. And it was a newspaper. What? But it's with Fred Hickey, who is the publisher and author of the High Tech high-tech strategist. I've mentioned him before. I mean, this dude has this newsletter where he started out. I started following this guy or became aware of him during the tech bubble in like 2000. And uh, he was warning about, you know, all of the basically bubble, bubble issues conditions during that time. Um, he also then was looking around for like, what's an alternative to investing in high tech because it was so overvalued then and he became kind of an also an expert on gold gold mining companies but anyways this guy's uh newsletter he's so old school that you have to like send a check to like an address to get on the to get the newsletter you can't there's not like a website you sign up at which i thought was kind of weird but i guess that's how he likes it i think if he marketed his newsletter he could properly online he could probably make a ton more money but I don't know the dude, so maybe that's just how he likes to do it. Anyway, um, I thought this was a good article. Like when I get a chance to listen to him, I like to listen to him. I know he was on Wealthy on about maybe a couple few months ago, which is uh, kind of a was a great interview, especially around the gold stocks that he talked about. But anyways, uh, just a couple blurbs from the interview, which I will post uh, the link to it, so you can read it at your leisure. Uh, it says here, it says, uh, I think we're still in a bear market, says uh, the author of the High Tech Strategist newsletter, a renowned contrarian. Valuations are extreme, even though the economy is heading towards recession. And major central banks like the Fed and the ECB have tightened monetary policy quite a bit. That's kind of where we're at. We're thinking about this, too. I mean, even if you look at, like, everybody has crowded into the whole um big cap tech names and then we've had this recent um push on tech due to ai which i talked about last week which is just the next you know the next story to get you to buy overvalued tech stocks that's you know ai is going to change the world i actually saw some things on fintwit one dude was saying that you know this is going to be the solution to all of our problems why he sees, you know, this particular person, not Fred Hickey, but somebody else made the assertion that, well, AI is going to result in, you know, 10% GDP growth every year for the next whatever. It's just, every time I hear this stuff, nothing's new under the sun, guys. Um, For all of the efficiencies and gains that AI is going to make, it's going to displace a lot of people. So there's going to be a lot of uh, improvements, but there's also going to be uh, redundancies created and, uh, you know, some people's jobs are just going to go extinct. So we'll see, but it's not, you know, that's, that's the thing. And then obviously, well, NVIDIA, you have to buy all these processors. It's the same thing we heard during like when crypto mining first started, right? We need all these processors and then they overbuilt. The thing got overvalued. The story plays out. People rush into it because it's a new shiny object. Some people make money on it because... They're able to get in and get out. 
uh, you know, that's not how we do it here. I, I'm looking for things that are undervalued, not things that are overvalued. And um, so that's why I think this is pre a prescient article. It's good to uh, at least listen to uh, the opposite story than what you're seeing, all the excitement in tech over AI. So that goes on here. He says, uh, I think we're still in a bear market. According to GMO co-founder and bubble historian Jeremy Grantham, we have been in a super bubble and the numbers bear that out. At the peak in early 2022, some stock market valuations like market cap to GDP and price to sales were 30 to 40% above previous 2000 record levels. And we've showed that before in some of the weekly updates. Uh, going on here with the article snippet, uh, today, even after last year's decline, we're still above these metrics. So valuations are extreme, even though the economy is having, heading towards recession and major central banks like the Fed and the ECB have tightened monetary policy quite a bit. So that's kind of our story, too, that we've been talking about here. Um, the data that I'm following bears that out, even though employment still remains, you know, hasn't cracked yet. But, uh, you know, I think it's a worthwhile article. This guy's been around a long time. He gets it. He does mention, you know, uh, some things around gold mining he gets into that about half the interviews about that. So I find that interesting, but you can also go look at like Jeremy Grantham's work at GMO and they, they track this stuff. And it's like, you know, they're expecting basically if you were to just buy and hold basically expecting over the next 10 years, five to 10 years, you're not going to see any gain or you're likely going to see a small loss just with all the ups and downs. It'll be volatile of course, but uh, for most people or, that's the expected gains just because we had such a large bubble. Okay. And you have to digest that and return to the mean and all that stuff. So you will, I think, see the return to the mean and then undervaluation punctuated with, as we've said before, violent counter cyclical rallies to the upside. If you're able to trade those, you know, I'll be with you, but uh, that's not what I do. Like I said, I'll put a link to this article. So um, one thing, you know, when I one thing I wanted to emphasize when we put up some of this data, I'm not a perma bear or a perma bull. I'm just looking at the data that I come across. I also don't want to fall into the trap or be accused of, you know, because you can go out and find any kind of data sets or any kind of information to bolster whatever argument you're making. And so we got to be cognizant of that bias. Um and that we're not doing that. We're not just going out and doing confirmation bias or following people that think the same way or just seeking out data points that seem to bolster the idea that we're heading into a recession or we're already in a recession. But I think, you know, some of these things are interesting. And it's like I said, keep these things in mind. You know, we have to acknowledge the fact that even with all this bad data, employment is not really cracking. We're not seeing additional claims going up. Um, we need to see see that and we're not seeing it so um until we see employment crack i mean i and, and the consumer really starts breaking down you know we we have this uh, very strange bifurcated you know uh economy where even though you have a lot of data points or some sectors of the economy like housing and manufacturing that are obviously in recession you still have the consumer as long as they have money in their pocket they're going to keep spending but here's a here's a data points uh, the freight waves national truckload index and you can see in white this is 2022 you can see uh the quote from this particular tweet was worst freight market since the great financial crisis they don't show the 2008 data they just show the last several years but you see like 2019 data before the pandemic in orange obviously um you know 2022 and then here we are in, in 2023. So we're below the 2022, um, quite a bit low. And so we're heading lower. So this isn't good, right? We talked about, I think last week or the week before, talking about corrugated cardboard boxes being down double digit. So you start putting the picture together, right? As you get more pieces of the puzzle, as demand goes down, less need for boxes to ship, less truck loads full of sh of shipped goods, it just starts cascading, right? Um, again, I believe that, you know, 
one of the reasons we haven't seen everything crack is because we just had such unprecedented amounts of liquidity injections into the economy. But as people burn through that, uh, their savings or burn through that cash, um, these other parts of the economy are starting to slow down and they're starting to exert more pressure, downward pressure uh, on the rest of the economy, i.e. housing, i.e. manufacturing. And now you're seeing it in trucking. So like I said, we don't want to just be looking for all the data points, you know, acknowledging, you know, that uh, watching the initial claims with the idea that they do get readjusted uh, periodically. There was uh, some recent data hiccups in it because there was a bunch of unemployment fraud in Massachusetts. But, you know, that's why you kind of look at like the long-term trend. You don't just look week to week, see what's the trend is. And um, that's, uh, like I said, until we see that crack, even though we are seeing manufacturing and construction jobs down, we're seeing a lot of service sector. I, I, I guess I have this view though, you know, with Memorial Day weekend and the summer vacation, this may be the last hurrah, the last party, if you will. And then as everybody blows their wad and has their last party in their travels and going to Disney World or going to the beach or whatever they're doing, um, whether they're using cash or credit cards or whatever, and then the hangover comes afterwards, and then the reality sets in in the third and fourth quarter. But we'll see. Uh, like I said, um, just watch the data. So this is, uh, got this off Twitter, just a reminder. We've talked about this before. These are the you know last several um, rate tightening cycles, as you can see, of the months on the bottom. You see the rates. You see how much we've increased rates currently. There's little blurbs put out to the right documenting you know, what broke or what what was the catalyst for reversal of Fed rate policy. You know, you see like uh, 2015 to 2018, reversal of QT leads to 20% stock market drop in cash repo markets. You remember that when Powell reversed um, dot-com crash, 99, 2000, housing market crash and eventual great financial crisis, 2004, 2006. So you can attach, you know, these things as being resultant of, you know, going through a period of low rates and free money causing malinvestment, causing things to uh, excess speculation. And then they it finally breaks once you take the liquidity away. We've taken quite a bit of liquidity away. We saw the recent bank failures, um, but we haven't seen that manifest into an all-out banking crisis. And I don't think it really will because of the fact that the banks really aren't over leveraged at this point like they were before. Yes, deposits are leaving the banks um, and going to uh, T-bills and stuff, but it's not to the level what's going to cause banking runs. And also, you know, I mean, as the economy now is going into recession, you're seeing bankers tighten, um, tighten credit. Uh, not giving out as much loans. And so I don't really see a, a banking crisis. What I think is going to be the catalyst, uh, what I think is potential is we haven't seen the end of the commercial real estate issue, which may feed in to some of the banks. We don't know yet. Um, we, we kind of have been reporting a little bit about like what happened, the report we had last week about that particular piece of real estate in San Francisco that basically sold at a 75% discount. So we haven't seen that. That could be a potential catalyst. And then, you know, corporate bonds, corporate high yield, corporate debt uh, with as the, as the need to refinance uh, what that's going to mean. So we haven't seen what the what's going to crack here or break as we're, we're waiting. So this is from uh, I can't remember the name of the company now, but uh, anyways, uh, this is talking about. Uh, what's the name of it? I can't remember. It's like a research firm, ASR, but they have their own proprietary lending composite indicator, which is in the dark green. And you can see going back to 95, uh, it shows this proprietary lending indicator. Then you see the actual U.S. commercial and industrial loans, uh, which is tracked. You know, you can get that from the Fed data. And you can see that what happens is, is as this proprietary indicator indicates, uh, it pretty pretty well tracks and predicts what's going to happen to commercial and industrial loans. Um, 
So you're, you're, you haven't seen commercial industrial loans really fall off yet. They're starting to. Uh, and so we could be heading for a credit crunch. You will note that you see these around recessionary times, um, loans to commercial industrial loans uh, retrench. And so, and, and, and it tightens, which makes perfect sense. Um, again, commercial and industrial loans can also be tied to U.S. leading indicators. You see leading indicators are well down, way down, as we've reported before, 13 straight months now of declining leading indicators. And you can see what happens to CNI loans during that time. So um, I don't really get where people are saying that we're not going to have a recession. Uh, we're not, you know, we're going to have a soft landing. I, I mean, I don't know uh, how much the economy will retrench, but it's obvious it's going to retrench. And so again, uh, if you are in the corporate America and you are one of the 25, 30, 40%, whatever of the Russell or whatever, that's a zombie company. I mean, and you need to refinance or you need credit and credit standards are tightening, what's going to happen? Remains to be seen. Wanted to point this chart out, you know, we're in the stealth uranium bull market. People don't want to acknowledge um, this is uh, the uranium futures on the COMEX. Maybe it's not the best guide, but you can see the chart. You can see the breakout back in May as we've moved up to, you know, into 53 and change uh, from this triangular formation, uh, ascending triangle, whatever you want to call it. I don't, I don't want to get too much into the squiggly line predictive basis, but you know, when you have this uh, tightening like this, and then you either break to the downside or the upside, you usually will see the follow through based on where the break went. So uh, you can see that somebody's put it, put this up here. Uh, obviously, you know, we're bullish on uranium. Um, it just requires patience, uh, which most people don't have, and the understanding that you have to be selective in where you put your money in the sector which we've talked about ad nauseum, but uh, I think this is pretty positive. This kind of, you know, you had this big move, you know, back in 2022 and then, you know, pulled back and then you had this consolidation and now we're breaking higher. So uh, it remains to be seen if this is going to fall through, if you're going to have a, you know, pull back, I don't know. But uh, again, uh, I just thought it was interesting and uh, I don't, like I said, there's not that many people that care about uranium anymore. They've moved on. But like I said, it's in a stealth bear market now, or bull market, I'm, excuse me. And uh, I'm still extremely bullish on it long term. Here's some, some more uranium news. There's a another physical uranium fund that's just going online in Switzerland. I'll put a link to the... Um, the management firm and the page that explains what it's doing, but basically says uh, it's from John Quakes this week, Swiss Zuri invest will close their initial hundred million dollar placement on 26 May after being extended due to technical issues with order processing processing. If filled uh, AMC physical fund will soon be buying nearly 2 million spot pounds. So another hundred million going in to buy uh, physical uranium, um, gives Europeans, people in Europe, a way to uh, buy into physical uranium. I don't know, you know, if people are precluded sometimes from buying ETFs in the U.S. or Canada. I don't know what the situation is. But uh, again, this is continued demand. This is more positive, um, you know, investment-based uh, demand that's going to be, on, that's on top of the structural long-term demand of a recovering nuclear power industry. So I wanted to point this out. I was listening to the board drilling earnings call and a couple snippets from the transcript. Um, board drilling is a offshore drilling company. They mostly have top line um, jackup rigs that work in shallower water. Um, as you may or may not know, uh, we're in a recovery, uh, sustained, sustainable recovery in offshore drilling. Um, obviously, the the thesis our thesis there is is that because of the depression that basically the offshore services went through uh it's the industry's consolidated quite a bit 
And so now that investment is recovering and going out and finding new resources, the same amount of rigs, services, boats, whatever, what have you just don't exist. And so this is just another uh, data point um, they re reported last week. And I pulled a couple snippets from the transcript. It says uh, jackup utilization levels have continued to increase year to date. In particular, the market utilization for modern rigs currently stands at 93.3% and at a level not sustainably seen since 2014. So that's that's a pretty high utilization rate for jackups. I didn't know that for the modern rigs. Uh, it goes on to say, uh, at the same time, modern rigs continue to gain market share versus standard rigs, reflecting the customer's preference for assets with superior capabilities. As time progresses, we expect the tightness in the modern jackup market to be exacerbated by the fact that over 30% of the current jackup fleet is beyond retirement age. And if you go and look at the, uh, there's a presentation, I believe, that they had for their earnings call. They show a chart showing that, uh, the age of the rigs of the industry. And again, it's just another one of these data points. It's all across like every hard asset, whether you want to talk about drilling rigs, drill ships, Row row boats, service boats, service providers, tankers, whatever you want to talk about, it's the same story, right? There's not enough supply. There hasn't been enough investment for various reasons. And now that as, as things recover, um, you know, no one's going to, uh, no one's made, made the investment. And then this last uh, snippet explains how that's going to lead to a sustained period of cash flow a positive cash flow and I think uh, you know enhanced earnings and ca and results for these companies it says in a normal scenario we, we would expect this attrition to be replaced by new builds. However, looking at the next slide, it is evident that extremely low order book levels will be insufficient to offset any future fleet attrition. The combination of high fleet utilization and low order book will continue to drive higher day rates. And so again, um, we're seeing this common theme across many companies in the industry, not only in this industry, but other industries like tankers, which I'll get into in a second. And, you know, whether it's drill ships, semi-submersibles, like I said, service boats, what have you, it's all the same thing. And no one's talking about now that day rates are surging across the industry. Um, now, now that people are, you know, uh, Final investment decisions are starting to pick up. More capital is going to come into the offshore sector for the reserve replacement that's needed for the longer life reserves, you know, uh, that people need to have. Uh, the, the renaissance, the rebirth of offshore drilling, uh, there's just not enough resources to do that. And again, one of the main reasons why I love this industry and why I think it's going to have a sustained recovery and yield tremendous results for shareholders is that no one's going to go rushing out and and build new rigs. Uh, whether you want to look at you know uh, service boats, rigs, whatever, no one's no one's doing that. And again, who's going to give you the money? You know, you have the ESG zeitgeist. Uh, the yards got stiffed. A lot of the yards that are, went bankrupt during the last uh, depression. You know, if you if you want to go to a a yard and ask them to build, you know, a billion dollar rig for you, they're going to ask for a lot of the money up front. They had before they would do, uh, you know, down payments and, you know, typical financing. Now they're going to want to make sure that they get their money because they got burned so bad. And like I said, a lot of people went bankrupt, uh, not only the service providers, but the, 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 the shipyards and, and other folks. So eventually as rates stay high for a longer period of time, it'll be inevitable that people will start building more rigs, but we're nowhere near that. The, 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 the bottom line is that this has a lot of runway. Yes. There's going to be fluctuations based on the oil price as algos sign thing, you know, s sell off if the oil price drops it. But, you know, if you look at, if you go through and start looking through all of these different companies, you're going to see a pattern of the same thing being said by the same, by, by, by all these different managements across the industry. And so you're in a, you're in a long-term bull market here. That's got three to five years legs. And like I said, I mean, when you're at 93% utilization, 
I mean, rates are going to go higher and they are going higher. So uh, just another data point for the offshore sector recovery, one of the major themes that we follow in the actionable intelligence alert newsletter. Um, here's something from Liz Ann Saunders, who's just a typical, uh, I think she's like a Schwab chief economist or anything, but we've shown this before. S&P energy sector's free cash flow yield continues to soar to multi-decade high. Uh, yeah, and it's not just because of high oil prices, because you can look at different periods in here uh, when we had even higher oil prices, but we didn't have these cash flow yields. So why do we have these cash flow yields? Because of the discipline that's now been imposed by managements and shareholders on these companies to lower debt, which raises cash flow because you're not servicing the same amount of debt anymore. Uh, so that revenue translates into cash flow. And not only that, you know, not making, not drill baby drilling anymore, just doing maintenance capital in a lot of cases or small growth or just enough to maintain production. And then seeing your cash flow, you know, rise. And then like we've said before, so again, um, even with these lower oil prices, the cash flow yields are going to be uh, higher than they were previously. And eventually I, I think that, um, you know, even with this recession coming and all of the different machinations and data points that we're seeing in the oil market vis-a-vis -vis supply and demand, you know, we're still seeing these, these companies spitting out, you know, tremendous amounts, record amounts of cash flow. So, uh, uh, not to be ignored. Obviously, if we had a great financial crisis and the oil price went to 40 and stayed there, you know, but that, if you look at the history, we've went over this before, that just doesn't happen. So not the way, you know, how things are, you know, the, the, the crashing of the oil price would be a temporary phenomenon, which would reverse uh, quite easily. The things that the, the things that would have caused an oil price decline of that magnitude that would severely impact cash flows long term will get reversed as soon as the, you know would, would cause a a response from the central banks and the government which would again you know because the investment hasn't been made you're gonna you know you have the you have a tremendous amount of potential for volatility in the oil price so you know, we talked about China a lot and the petroleum demand. I mean, India is booming. Uh, I think they're setting new records. Now, China just came out. China petroleum demand reaches new high. This is a record. Here's your April 2023 apparent oil demand. You can go through the different uh, categories. I mean, you can just go down here to the bottom here and look at the apparent demand. Um, April versus May. This is m millions of barrels a day. So you're you know, you're up 5% month over month, you're 26% year over year, obviously the reopening. So people saying that, well, the Chinese right reopening doesn't really matter. It was a little bit weaker than thought. If you look across here, um, like kerosene demand, that's mostly your jet fuel. Uh, look at even gasoline demand year over year is up 23%, diesel up 29%. That's coming out of your lockdowns, right? So um, obviously, maybe some people have been underwhelmed, but I, I, I think this is pretty uh, uh, spot on of what we thought would happen. Maybe it's, you know, we've had some recent lockdowns around China. Uh, one thing people don't seem to understand is that public health policy in China, even prior to COVID, they would have lockdowns during influenza, but they didn't get, you know, for short periods of time. And like we saw, for example, I think a week ago, I saw some data about, uh, automobile congestion in certain cities, it was down like 30 or 40%. Well, that's because they had some um, pe telling people to stay home because they had a outbreak of COVID again. So um, nothing to panic and nobody's saying they're going to shut the country down again, like they did before. I think we're well past that now, but you can see, uh, you know, you can see like overall month to month, I mean, you're making new all-time highs in petroleum demand in China. So I don't know. It's uh, we're like I said, look at like jet fuel demands up 204 percent since last year, uh, 724,000 barrels a day of kerosene. That's well, basically your jet fuel. But um, even diesel, you know, people are saying, well, the Chinese economy, I mean, look at diesel rates. Uh, it's up 30 percent year over year. It's up 7 percent month to month. So um, I don't like I said, 
uh, you don't want to hang your hat on one data point, but for a lot of the naysayers, I mean, the demand's there. And then you look at a place like India, it's making record new highs too. So again, um, this is why I haven't thrown my thrown thrown the towel in on oil demand and the oil price. Uh, I think that um, it has a potential in the second half of the year. If you look at what the IEA, we went over that data last week, uh, what OPEC and the IEA are saying. Now there's been some, I've read some commentary that the IEA has kind of been compromised a little bit. They're getting influence from the U.S. to say certain things so that they can, you know, get OPEC to pump more oil. I don't get into all that. I'm just telling you that uh, I can only take in the data that I'm getting. I'm not an insider. I'm a generalist investor and I'm just seeing these trends. So that's why I haven't really thrown in the towel on a, some of the oil companies we have in the portfolio, just because even with the uh, lower, obviously with the lower oil price, your cash flows are going to be, you know, go down a little bit over time. Not a little bit. I mean, oil price is down, you know, 40% off the highs, right? So, but that was in the context of an oversupplied market in the first few months of this year. And now it looks like if you total everything up, we're going to be undersupplied for the rest of the year. And like I said, we've now entered Memorial Day weekend. This is the heavy travel season in the U.S. We'll have to see what happens. And uh, this may be, the, like I said, the last hurrah. Maybe we we push up and, and maybe it will underwhelm. I don't know, but we'll see. But I think uh, uh, this this to me gives me uh, a little bit you know more confidence in a, a higher oil price. So it says uh, EU replaces, this is uh, from Bloomberg. They make some good charts. If you get on, there's a daily thing you can get on their like energy email. They put some good charts out. Um, EU replaces Russian diesel bullish product tankers. I put there because why? Well, if you see the black is the, uh, these are diesel imports from various regions. You see prior to the, um, at least recently, up till recently, even after the uh, incursion by the Russians into Ukraine, the EU was still taking tremendous amounts of diesel from uh, Russia, but that's stopped now. And so what you see is who, somebody has to pick up the slack, right? Because the demand doesn't really disappear. And so you see the demand or the supply has picked up from the Middle East. Well, what does that mean? It's what we've talked about before for product tankers. You have to ship the diesel from um, the Middle East or Asia on these longer trips instead of some Baltic Sea export port for Russia uh, for diesel to Europe right across the Baltic Sea or the North Sea or whatever into Europe or, or or the UK, you now have to come from the Middle East or Asia. Now, people will say, well, what does that happen to this Russian diesel? The, the Russian diesel just goes to Saudi Arabia. They buy it. They use it internally. Then they export their diesel or they just transship it. And there's all kinds of little weird things. It doesn't just like punish the Russians. They just sell it at a discount to somebody else like Saudi, they use it, you know, for their power burns and stuff like that. A lot of their, a lot of their electricity production is based off uh, oil uh, fired generation. So, or like I said, they just relabel it. Who knows what really goes on? Once it goes into a tank and gets mixed, you don't know what, what's going on. The thing I wanted to emphasize was longer trips with the same amount of tankers, um, results in higher rates because we're not building any more tankers either. And that's that's why I wanted to show this chart. This is some tanker points from Cleves. They do a lot of reporting on shipping. Again, you know, we talked about that, the drilling rigs, what Bohr said about drilling rigs, it's the same thing with tankers, right? It says order book to fleet ratio is the lowest on our records. So this is what Cleves does. They track this stuff. And this is the lowest you've seen. 3.7% replacement rate is the lowest they've ever seen. And so you don't have new tankers being built, even with day rates have have had a step change to a higher level, okay, that I think can be maintained for some period of time. And people say, well, they'll just build more tankers. Well, the problem is yards are, the shipyards are sold out on capacity well into 2025. So you're not, you know, you had these big um, uh, day rate increases for container shipping during the pandemic and some other other forms of shipping. And so that's what happened, right? They got flush with cash, the shipping companies, and they put all the order books surged for container ships. You can see it right here, container vessels. You see how it blew up over the last, this year and next year, the order book blew up relative to 
uh, previous years. And so there's only so much capacity in the yards, right? And so you don't see the uh, you don't see the uh, oil and product tankers being ordered, okay? And yet you have higher demand in India and China. You have longer trips because of the discombobulation of the trade routes due to the sanctions. And so you see why I'm bullish on tankers. Again, another reason I wanted to talk about this from Bloomberg, you know, I'm, you know, whether you, whatever your personal feelings are, or scientific feelings are around climate change, I don't really want to get into that. What I would say is that, you know, with these emerging markets, um, their ability to grow, their ability to provide um, a higher standard of living for their people is incumbent upon energy use. Obviously, it goes without saying, if you have a higher GDP, a higher standard of living for your folks, you need high, bigger and bigger energy inputs. I mean, there's just so much lack of knowledge and understanding around energy. Um, this really, how you can use this to your advantage, because this is what's actionable. You know, this idea that you're just going to like get get rid of coal. India and China and these developing countries are not just going to get rid of coal because a bunch of people in the EU or in DC said so. It's not going to happen. And so again, what you are going to see though is like I said, constricted supply, but yet an increase in the use. That doesn't mean that over time more nuclear plants will be built, more renewable plants. I don't know, but you can see that, you know, that even even this is the the the, tit the title of this slide it says even after significant investment in renewable energy india's power generation remains dependent on coal so there you are um i would assume others would be like maybe biomass and nuclear i mean nuclear power just has so much potential growth in these countries i mean if you can't see it over the next 20 30 years because quite frankly we're just not going to build we're not going to replace all of this coal generation, okay, with um, solar and wind. It's just not going to happen. We don't have the materials. Uh, not every area is, you know, perspective for solar and wind. And so I think, you know, if you don't want to choke on coal particulate matter, then, you know, that's why you see places like India and China have these huge commitments to building more and more nuclear power plants. You know, there was a recent article I read about a guy, I think he's a Czech billionaire, I forget the guy's name, Daniel Krasinski, something like that. Anyways, he really, when coal really took a shellacking in like 2016, 2017, he really bought into a bunch of coal assets, which have rebounded quite a bit, and he's made a tremendous amount of money. Like I said, coal's not going to go away, even in the West, it's, it's just not going to. A uh, simple fact is if you just took all this coal generation away tomorrow or like in the next year, I mean, three quarters or 80 percent of the population of India would die. And it's the same thing in the West. I mean, if you took away, just snapped your fingers and, 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 and took all that remaining coal generation offline in the next year, I mean, you would have a massive deflationary depression, joblessness. I mean, you'd have a revolution. And so... If you if you really understand things, you know, energy transitions take decades. It's not going to happen in an election cycle. And so the the potential for opportunity, even in the short term, I guess, you know, thermal coal, for example, is a cyclical business. But again, the downtrend that we're seeing, is it going to go to previous lows or are we going to reset at a higher level? And again, eventually, you know, like in the U.S., the market for thermal coal is really influenced a lot by natural gas prices. So you really have to understand what's going on. But I think, you know, over the long term, next, like I said, five to 10 years, we're, we, we have this shortage of molecules, which is, you know, going to uh, create opportunity for higher prices and the, for those prices to be sustained at a higher level for a longer period of time. You know, here's another thing to think about. I mean, this is, I like to point these things out. These S curves, I think are very interesting. This is the growing demand for cooling. Developing countries like China and India are projected to be the biggest markets for future air conditioner sales. And you see here's 2020, you know, what's 2023. I mean, India is just now ramping up. China is going through an S curve um, because, you know, it gets hot in these places and you don't even see sub-Saharan Africa on here or South America or anything like that. So, 
Um, you see what the potential is, you know, for for this increased energy usage again, as people's become wealthier, they want more comforts, the comforts that you have, you know, I'm sitting here in Texas, it's 91 degrees outside, I have the thermostat set at 77. And the air conditioner is cycling and keeping me uh, in relative comfort and coolness. Uh, I don't can't imagine, you know, sitting here, uh, sweating with the windows open with no breeze, and the humidity upward is in a place like Houston, Texas. And so Again, once people can afford these things in these emerging markets, they're going to go there. And so this isn't just bode well for energy consumption. It's also talking about copper and all the materials that go into making the air conditioners, which we've talked about before. So this is what people need to understand. This is just one data point, you know, so this is, you know, keeping this in mind when you're talking about where you're thinking about, you know, energy usage. Um, the lack of investment in in resources and how that's going to be affected is this is just one data point, one demand point, air conditioning. So um, I follow a lot of what I call, uh, you know, one of my th things is, is that I think that the West is really, you know, rowing up, you know, against the wind or rowing upstream on this ESG thing. They've fully bought in and committed, which is fine, but the rest of the world hasn't. But now as the, you know, it's one thing to talk about goals. It's one thing to postulate on what you want to do and what you think should happen. But once you start to try to implement these things, as we've seen in places like California, what we've seen in, in Germany with the Energie Vende, uh, and some of these other places, these real life laboratories, uh, it's more difficult to actually implement. And so that's why I say we're kind of like at peak ESG. We've seen a lot of the original um, people that, especially like even in the investment community, large investment firms, JP Morgan, others uh, are kind of pulling back from some rhetoric they had originally, uh, just because it can kind of be seen now it's going to be a lot harder, more difficult uh, uh, or messy trying to get to these things. And can you actually make money doing this? And so this is just a, like I said, I put this news in here because that's my theory that we've kind of reached peak ESG um, as reality begins to set in. And this is a snippet from the article. Uh, it's a Bloomberg article it was behind a paywall. But like I said, I get an email that summarizes a lot of these articles every week. Um, and uh, this is just I thought was interesting. It says a key element of the European Union's Green Deal package has been delayed after France, the bloc's biggest supporter of nuclear power, said it won't back a law to scale up re renewable energy. And so if you know how the EU works, you know, you only need one member state to not agree to something and it jams the work works up. Uh, the article goes on. Other snippet here says France is objecting to the small role nuclear could play in meeting 2030 targets for green hydrogen and in industry amid concerns about the cost of converting ammonia plants from gas to electricity. It has previously signaled that it would also like to see nuclear included in a list of strategic clean energy technologies that the EU wants to produce domestically. And so, you know, uh, obviously France has a very large nuclear power industry. They, I think, are still around 50% of their power is producing nuclear nuclear power. They made that commitment in the 70s during the energy crisis. They have a very large engineering construction, you know, they have a big industry that supports that uh, nuclear industry. And so you're seeing, you know, you know, this pushback because again, uh, people have their own interests. Uh, countries have their own interests. And sometimes they don't gel with the rest of the other members in the EU. This is the kind of conflict that you see. But I think you're going to see more of this, not less of it, just because as the costs become um, manifest, as people start, you know, figuring out what's going on, the costs are just not going to be, uh, or the, 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 the availability of resources. You simply do not have enough resources for the entire world to move to a re even one cycle of fully renewable energy production. It's just it just doesn't exist. And like I've said before, you, you, you're hamstringing yourself in the West by saying you want to do this transition, but then you won't allow for the extraction of the resources and minerals necessary to facilitate the transition. So 
Uh, there's a lot of work to do here uh, on this. And uh, again, I think you're going to see more of this type of pushback uh, as, as this thing moves forward. I mean, as I pointed out with the coal usage in India, for example, I mean, these other countries are just not going to go there. Uh, they're going to, they're, they're more interested in providing a higher standard of living for their folks, energy security, strategic planning, things of this nature, and not wedded to some, to an ideology that is very rigid. Uh, I think that's the most generous way I can put it. All right, guys, I kind of flew through the slides this week. Again, uh, appreciate uh, the channel. Like I said, the channel continues to grow. Um, I know a lot of people, you know, visit the channel. I uh, hope these, th these, these videos are useful for you. Uh, again, you know, just to summarize, uh, I'm not making any major, you know, changes to my portfolio at this point, uh, scaling back here and there where necessary. Uh, I wouldn't be going crazy trying to enter in a new, new positions right now. We have a portfolio. Um, I own the stocks in the portfolio for various reasons, which I've explained. It's kind of been holding in fairly well. But uh, I don't, you know, with liquidity tightening, with, you know, you know, I think it showed last week Germany has entered a recession officially. It won't be too much longer before the U.S. enters a recession. Um, until I see global liquidity start to turn and uh, people get off the, you know, right now we're still on that we're going to crush inflation mindset around the world. Until we see that change, um, I still think you just, you know, what's wrong with getting 5% in T-bills? It's so easy to do. Uh, you should be doing that if you have any wealth. I, I would just hold my powder. Like I said, we're going to wait till we can see the whites of their eyes and then we'll open fire. But right now, the best just hold your fire. Keep abreast of, because these trends that we're talking around energy and around tankers and around drilling, these are long-term trends that are going to play out over this decade. But over the next six months to a year, you know, we're going to have this cyclical uh, downturn, which I think is going to even hit our stocks. But we'll have to wait and see. Uh, you can't predict. I can't predict 100% what's going to happen. So I think there's no reason to like go running into these things if you're new. I mean, I have, like I said, some positions, but I have a lot more and more capital going into just short-term cash, uh, T-bills, and, and money market funds. So that's it for this week, guys. Um, appreciate your uh, viewership and we'll talk to you next week.